Hi, this is Kristen Hoffman from Baker Buddy, and you are listening to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. Hey, awesome food bloggers. Before we dig into this episode, I have a really quick favor to ask you. Go to your favorite podcast player, go to Eat Blog Talk, scroll down to the bottom where you see the ratings and review section. Leave Eat Blog Talk a five-star rating if you love this podcast and leave a great review. This will only benefit this podcast. It adds value. And I so very much appreciate your efforts with this. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, now on to the episode. Hello, food bloggers. Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, sponsored by Rank IQ. I am your host, Megan Porta, and you are listening to episode number 269. Today, I get to have a conversation with Kristen from Baker Betty, and we are going to talk about how to build your on-camera confidence. Kristen Baker Betty Hoffman is a trained chef and baking educator known for her ability to break down baking fundamentals and baking science in an easily digestible way. She does this through tutorials on her YouTube channel, Instagram, TikTok, and through in-person workshops in the Chicago area. Most recently, Kristen released a baking fundamentals book, Baker Betty's Better Baking Book. Oh my gosh, (laughs) say that 10 times. I love it though, Um, which focuses on explaining the whys of baking and was named by Food Network as one of the top 10 baking books of 2021. Wow. Okay. I'm going to come back to that. Her goal is always to help others build their confidence in the kitchen and feel at ease when baking. Okay. I'm supposed to prompt you for a fun (laughs) fact now, but I want to ask you about that. You were named as a Food Network Top 10 Baking Book? Yes, I was. It was super exciting. So yeah, I just published my very first book, actually just about three weeks ago, and Food Network named it as one of the Top 10 Baking Books of 2021. So That had to feel so amazing, and what a way to celebrate your accomplishment. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I was very, very honored to be like on a list with somebody like Martha Stewart. I mean, (laughs) you know, really, really really um, surreal to see. So it was really exciting. Well, that speaks to the job you did putting it together. So nice work and congratulations. That is a huge accomplishment. Now, I feel like that kind of was a fun fact in itself, but do you have another one to share with us? Yeah, um, I guess my probably um, most interesting fun fact about myself at this moment is that I have a pretty extensive vintage glassware collection. So I collect a lot of vintage Pyrex, um, Fire King, Hazel Atlas. I like to collect all of this like really colorful, vibrant vintage glassware. So if you look at um, any of my videos on TikTok or YouTube, you'll see I, I have a collection behind me and all of my videos with this very vibrant collection of mostly vintage mixing bowls. And um, I love to actually use them in my baking. So some of my bowls are up to like 70 years old. It's really fun to bake with them. That is such a cool fun fact. So I'm looking at your little thumbnail here on Skype as we chat. Is that what you're referring to? Oh my gosh, those are so pretty. I love the color and I love the, it's like a teal or like an aqua um, turquoise and orange. Those are great. Oh, love that. Okay. You are here to chat about building an on-camera confidence. I think this is such a hard thing for so many people listening, myself included. It's scary, right? Like, it is. Especially <laughs> at first. Yes. It's almost like we push it away because we just think, no way, I can't do that. I can't be natural. But we've got to start somewhere, right? So... Can you talk to us about how you got started with it? Was it scary for you at first? And if so, how did you overcome that? Yeah, absolutely. So I started my blog, Baker Betty, about 10 years ago. And truthfully, where the name Baker Betty came from was born from the fact that I was an extremely shy person. And I didn't know that I wanted my real, you know, a name and person to be out in the world. I didn't know that I wanted people to know who I truly was. So uh, Baker Buddy stemmed from something that I was kind of hiding behind. Uh, Now it has become kind of my online persona that I fully embrace and um, am very public with. But uh, I started out in this world as being an extremely shy person, somebody who absolutely would not even think about putting myself in front of the camera. 
Um, but, you know, through the years, I started seeing how much video had to offer this business. I have always been somebody that really enjoys um, creating content from a educational perspective. I love to teach about baking and try to make it super approachable. And there is a great deal you can do with that through written content, but being visual with doing that and putting myself in front of the camera truly is one of the best ways to teach. And so eventually I kind of got to this point where I was like, okay, if I really want to grow this educational part of my business, I think I'm going to have to get in front of the camera. I think I'm going to have to figure out how to do this. And the idea of that was truthfully terrifying. I mean, like make me want to throw up kind of terrifying. And if you go back and look at some of my original videos, they are quite painful (laughs) to watch because I was very uncomfortable, was very shy and very scared, truthfully. Um, But, you know, I don't know if you have ever heard this quote. I uh, probably about five years ago, I heard this quote from Ira Glass where he talks about how people who do creative work typically start doing creative work because they have good taste. And when they first start doing it, their taste is good enough to recognize that their work is not good and that it's not living up to, you know, their ambition. And so a lot of people just stop there and don't kind of push through that painful point in which your work is not good. But the key part of getting to the other side of that is to just keep doing it. And that's how you get from the the painful, not good work to work that you're proud of. And when I heard that quote, it really kind of put things in perspective to me um, in that I can't expect myself to be good at something that I've never done. And I think I sort of had this misconception that there were people who were naturally good on camera. And I there are, you know, it's not it's not that there is not any innate talent in that. But I think that's a misconception and that people who are good on camera are typically good on camera because they have practiced being on camera and they have a lot of experience with it. And so I just started making, um, I started with Instagram stories first and then kind of moved over to YouTube and most recently have done a lot with TikTok. But I kind of just gave myself permission that I, I could create bad content. I could create bad videos because that was the way in which I was going to get to the other side to content that I was proud of. So that's really what kind of jump started me into creating video and putting myself in front of the camera. I think it's great for the rest of us to hear that it was terrifying for you. I mean, I'm sorry that it was, but you know, like you said, we see people who have curated videos who seem so confident and we just assume that it's always been like that. And that is Mm -hmm. so rarely the case. I feel like if that is the case for anyone, it's such an anomaly. Yes. Yeah. I agree. So I appreciate that you're sharing this, that you even share that it was terrifying to the point of wanting to throw up like that is that's terrifying. Right. And the fact that you started with an alternate name because you were so shy about it. So what a transformation. Oh, my gosh. So you have pushed through some massive fears. And do you find that through getting through those fears, you've found such great rewards on the other side? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I I think that in starting this, what I will sort of refer to as an experiment and that I'm going to create bad content, hoping I'll get to the other side in which I feel good and confident about it. I don't think I ever truly believed that it would ever feel comfortable. I think I believed that I would get better at it and that I would um, start being more proud of my work. But I think I thought it would I would always be in this place where it felt like a struggle and where it felt very nerve wracking and uncomfortable. And the most surprising thing has been is that it it absolutely has become something that feels very easy for me, very natural. I don't get nervous or stressed before I have to even go live on something. You know, I did WGN News the other day. I did a live show and 
four years ago, if I would have done that, I mean, leading up to that would have been sleepless nights. You know, I would have been so stressed about it, but it just feels so easy now. But because I have pushed through all of those hard parts, and I think that has been the most rewarding and surprising part of this process is just pushing through those hard parts has really made it feel so much easier. I can relate so much to this. So I was probably the shyest kid in the world. I'm 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 not even kidding when I say that. My family, right. like I would only speak to my family for a really long time. It was ridiculous, but I was so shy and the idea of like putting myself out there and I don't do a lot of video, but I host a podcast now. So when I started right. this podcast, the idea of putting myself out there and contacting people and saying, will you be on my show? And mm. then not just that, but having them come and like, I'm in charge of this show and I have to conduct an interview. That was right. so, so scary for me. Like, oh, like I bet. throw up stage, like what you were talking yes. about, Kristen. Um, but I did the same thing as you. I was like, you know, you need to do this. It is scary. You just sit down and do it. And for the first year that I hosted this podcast, I don't know if any of you could tell, but I was terrified. I was freaking out. And because I pushed through, just like Kristen did, I am now to the point where it is not a big deal to me. I love having these conversations. I feel ease at ease. I'm never nervous. I do very little prep. Like it is just right. so easy. So I think we both have that message to share with you today that if you just face those fears and we acknowledge it's scary, but if you acknowledge it and then do it anyway, you will be rewarded in the end. And I think being vulnerable too. I mean, when I first started putting myself on Instagram specifically in Insta stories, I was very open and vulnerable with my audience that this is uncomfortable and this is very scary for me. And your audience can relate to that. And that can really kind of um, sort of take away the pressure off of you that you're, you're having to do this really great job. You're being honest that this is new and difficult. And people respond really well to that. People don't like for you to show up appearing perfect. Oh, and, absolutely. Like, highly curated. They're like, really? Is that really you? Mm -hmm. But if you can acknowledge that I'm just a real person, I'm scared. This is like a real fear of mine. People like that. They will actually love you more. Absolutely agree. Yeah. So how much of a time investment would you say you put in before you got to the point where you were like, oh, this is easy? And did it just happen overnight where you realized it? Or was it a progression over time? Yeah, I would say it was a pretty slow, gradual progression. Um, I, I would say I have been consistently creating video content for about four years. It's not that I hadn't done any before that, but that's when I really committed to it and really started diving in deep with it. And I would say that it probably took maybe the first year before I felt like it wasn't so hard to watch myself and listen to myself. It wasn't so anxiety provoking to just, you know, get on there and do it. But you know, pr probably at about the two and a half year mark or so, it really did start feeling very easy, very natural to just get up and present. Um, but, you know, I always sort of see it as something that I will never be finished with. You know, there's always something to, to learn. There's always something to get better at. In the, in the world of being on camera, you know, I now that I have been on camera a lot, you I mean, you definitely hear feedback and criticism and some of it is valid. And so I, I try to hear that without taking it too personally and try to um, put things in, into practice that could make my video content better. But that at the beginning, I really had to avoid looking at criticisms and critiques because the point of it was to just do it, to just get the, get in there and try. And I think it was really important for me to actually avoid looking at criticism at first because I didn't want that to get me too caught up in my head. Um, but I'm at the point now where I can look at that and take it and and 
put some of that feedback into action. I think that's a really great thing to bring up is to just be really careful to, you know, about what you're reading about your content in the beginning until you get to that place where you're more confident and you can look at it and be like, oh, whatever, that's fine. Right. <laughs> yeah. And do you feel like doing the sort of thing, like pushing through two and a half years of something that's really scary until you're comfortable? Do you feel like that can positively impact other parts of your life? Have you seen this show up in other areas of your life in a good way? Oh, Yes, absolutely. So this whole experiment has really shown me that you can get to the other side. When you push through something hard, you can't get to the other side. It will not always be hard. And in this business, we are constantly having to learn new things and go through those very painful parts, you know, whether it's learning photography, or I just recently learned flash photography, which was so painful to learn, but I'm so incredibly glad I did, Um, you know, or getting on a new platform or whatever it is to push through those hard parts. The other thing that I think has been such a positive experience from this is that I feel I have become much more confident just overall in my life, in all aspects of my life. I think putting myself on camera and allowing myself to just be me and not trying to be something I'm not, you know, you see people on Food Network and they're these huge, big personalities. And I think I kind of always thought, oh, I have to like become this persona and be something that I'm not naturally you know, in front of the camera, but allowing myself to just be me and to let my audience see me for who I am has really just made me embrace myself fully in all aspects of my life. I think I've just become a much more confident person in general. I was hoping you would say that. I was kind of assuming that is um, a byproduct of what you've been doing this experiment that you're calling it. Um, I've definitely noticed the same with myself and hosting a podcast. Yeah. It has affected just the way that I interact with people day to day. Like I'm more confident in my conversations. Mm -hmm. I exactly what you said. I feel like I'm more authentic. I'm talking Mm -hmm. about things that matter instead of just filling it with fluff. So I really do feel like doing something like this can spill over in positive ways. Absolutely. And I think it really helped me find my voice with my business. You know, I've always approached my content from this educational perspective and from a teaching perspective, but it, you know, we get really distracted. It's very easy to get very distracted in this business by what everybody else is doing and um, seeing what was working for other people. And it's hard to not get sidetracked by all of that. But I think making video content and developing my confidence with that has really helped me find my like true voice and, and really helped me find my true audience as well, the people that are looking for what I am making. So Video has so many benefits in this business, but I think it can just really help you hone in on your brand. Do you have tips for somebody who is either and thinking about getting into video or maybe has started getting into it and is just like, oh my gosh, this is too scary? Do you have tips for just getting over that hump and you know, encouraging them to move forward with it? Yeah. So I think that I obviously the kind of overarching theme is allow yourself to to be bad at it. Give yourself permission to make content that is bad. And I I would just would sort of say to myself, okay, I want to make this video and I'm just going to do it. It's okay if it's bad, but it's just as long as I do it. And I think also trying not to get yourself too overwhelmed with all of the pieces when you start. When I very first started creating video content, I started with hands and pans. You know, everybody probably has made one of those videos. So that seems much easier. You're just showing your hands. You're not showing your, um, your face, but adding a voiceover to a hands and pans video is going to make it much more personal and start showing your personality a little bit before you're going to put your face in front of the camera. So sometimes that can be like maybe just a good little segue into, Getting some on-camera confidence is just allowing your voice to be heard. Let's take a really quick break to talk about a service I'm really excited to share with you. As a food blogger, you've got so much on your plate. You are busy developing recipes, taking photos, writing posts, managing social media, and all of the other things. 
You work hard to help your readers live a more delicious life. Even though you enjoy working in your business, I think we all do it because we love it. Your to-do list is probably a mile long. You know what I'm talking about. And maybe there are certain things you'd rather not deal with, such as writing. If writing is not your cup of tea, you do not have to go it alone. Heather Eberly is a content writer for food brands. She uses copywriting and marketing techniques to grow your business so you can focus on doing the things you love. If you want to gain Google traction, stand out from the crowd, and take your income to the next level, Heather can help you. Go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash resources to get more information about Heather's services. And as a bonus for eBlog Talk listeners, all projects booked during January 2022 will receive a 20% discount. Again, go to eblogtalk.com forward slash resources and click on Heather's link. Mention that Megan sent you to receive your discount. And now let's get back to the episode. Um, I also think that we need to be okay with not having every perfect piece of equipment to make the perfect video to start. You know, these things can slowly build and slowly get better with time. Phone cameras ha- are pretty awesome these days. I have made many a video on my iPhone. I will even sometimes edit them right on my iPhone. And um, that is a great way to, to kind of take out a piece that might be overwhelming from the process is to just m- keep the equipment very simple. Maybe you're just going to film on your iPhone and you're just allowing yourself to do it in a way that is super manageable. And as you get comfortable with that, then you can think about maybe adding some lights or a nicer camera and some editing software. Um, But you don't need to have all of that together right at the beginning, because that's super overwhelming. It's It's a lot to learn. And it's a lot to figure out. And I think that that can really you know, stunt people from starting. And I think in any aspect of food blogging, really keeping it simple is such solid advice. Absolutely. Because we can overcomplicate everything in this business, whether it's photography and buying the perfect lens Mm -hmm. and like just starting with what you have. Literally, you mentioned, Kristen, that you started on Instagram stories. Mm -hmm. So if you're considering this, maybe just start there. Absolutely. Do an experiment for, I don't know, do like a two week experiment where you get on Instagram stories every day. And then after that period, you'll probably have a little bit more confidence and then you can move to the next level. Look around you. What do you have? You probably have a phone and just starting there. Yeah. The other thing that I did at the very beginning, I'm just now remembering, I really struggled to do Instagram stories because of the front facing camera and me not getting distracted by looking at myself and over analyzing what I'm looking at. So I would like tape a little piece of like paper over the screen so that I couldn't see myself while I was talking because it was so hard for me to watch myself. So that was like a little trick that helped me in the very beginning. Wow. I love that. That's a great nugget. Do you by chance use Marco Polo? Yes. That was another thing that was super helpful was I started doing Marco Polo with my friends and it's a very similar kind of platform where you're front facing camera talking to the camera and uh, if listeners don't know what Marco Polo is, is it's it's a video like communication app. You can you know, start groups with different people. Like I have one with two of my best friends. You send a video message and then they can watch it and they can send one back and forth. And um, and then you can kind of interact with it like you do on Instagram. I brought it up because it's a really good way to practice with like the way that you're looking and talking to yourself basically on your phone because at first it's kind of awkward when I first started getting on Marco Polo I was like this is weird I'm just talking to me you're recording a video of yourself talking but you're looking at you right so that might be awkward if you're not used to it but doing that really got me used to I don't know just like lighting and like angles that looked weird and ways that I was talking weird or weird things that I was doing or mannerisms. So if you do that, you will likely be more accustomed to just 
looking at yourself. Yeah, it really does help. I yeah, it's so funny, because that is another thing that I was doing at the very beginning that really did help. And then I think once you're used to that, you know, Marco Polo is something you do with people, you know, getting on Instagram, it does kind of start feeling like, oh, I'm just checking in with my friends now. I'm going to just post this to people I know. Right. It normalizes it a little bit. So it's, it does. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned before, you've said this a few times, actually, and I love it, just giving yourself permission to create bad content. Do you ever take your like really bad content and make light of it? You know, just pull out the pieces like, oh, my gosh, look at this that I said, like, and just laughing at it. Do you ever do anything like that? And what are your thoughts on that? Yes, um, I, I do probably more between my assistant and I, we will sometimes go back and like send each other clips from my old videos and just kind of laugh at how bad they are. Um, one of the things that I really struggled with when I very first started recording video was uh, forgetting that I'm talking directly into a microphone and I would project my voice like I was tra- talking to a crowd. And my assistant's like, you're you're right in the microphone. Like you do not need to yell. Um, so that's pretty funny to look back at. But yeah, and I I have done a few times where I will show to my even to my audience to just be like, you know, this is where I started. You know, I think it's so easy for us to see each other in this business and be like, look at this great content they're making and. We have all been at the beginning. Every single one of us has started from the beginning. And, you know, whether you're at the point where you feel much more confident and comfortable now um, or not, we've all been in that place. And so I think it's really helpful to remember that and to, you know, not see the content that's bad, you know, poor content as something to be embarrassed of. It's just all part of the process. It's all part of what got you to where you are or what is getting you to where you want to be. It's part of your story. Absolutely. And I think making light of our quote, bad content is actually a good way to remind ourselves of that progress we've made. Because when we see it, we're like, oh, well, I probably wouldn't do that now. But I mean, we're always on the journey. We're always evolving and you know, there are mistakes we make now, of course, but maybe in the future we won't be making them. But I love the idea of just bringing those little snippets, whether you're like stumbling over a word or you do some like yelling into a microphone, whatever, (laughs) and saying just like, look at this. Oh my gosh. And making light of yourself. I think people really appreciate. They're like, oh, she's a real human. She makes mistakes. Absolutely. So It's a way to really, you mentioned this earlier too, to connect with your audience more. Right. And it's a way to embrace the journey rather than feeling shame about it. That was very well said. I don't know if you know Jason Logston. He is um, a Mm, food blogger, but he also like he speaks a lot on sous vide and he's a big uh, self-publishing cookbook guy. So this is something that he does that I love. Whenever he's speaking and he trips over words and he says some doozies like we all do, he will actually pull that out and put the clips on Instagram and be like, and then he'll like Mm. write out the string of words that he said that made no sense. Uh I just feel like that is so brilliant because everyone that watches it is like, I love you more because you, you were willing to be vulnerable with us and show us your worst string of words that isn't even a word. And I just love that he embraces that. I was just going to say, like you said, our audience doesn't want to see a perfect person. I mean, it's not relatable. No. And I feel like being someone who curates food too, um, people see our Instagram feeds that look, quote, perfect, right? And they are like, wow, she must be really perfect. She put all that together. So to see a side that is far from perfect, I think is relieving for a lot of people. I believe that people will find you just more likable and more trustworthy because of it. I agree. Absolutely. Um, So talk about like your audience. And once you started doing this and just making a commitment to do video more often, Have they talked to you about it? Like, oh, we love your video. What kind of feedback have you gotten from them? Yeah, I mean, I feel as though video has really helped me develop what we would call our raving fans. You know, I had people who have followed me. You know, I started Baker Betty 10 years ago. So there were, you know, about six years before I was really 
diving into video. And not that I didn't have followers before that, but I feel like this vi- the video content has really developed my core audience that's really here to follow me and um di- you know, take in all of the content that I'm creating. And I I constantly get feedback that while yes, the written recipes are helpful, the the video content is what really connects the dots for people. I think a lot of people really struggle to just digest written content in a way that makes sense, especially when they're learning a brand new technique or something that's a little more advanced or complicated. Um, You know, I actually created a ton of video content about sourdough pre-pandemic. I had done it 2019. I created this whole very detailed video Um, playlist on YouTube that you could go through sequentially. And, you know, sourdough became the whole darling of of the pandemic. And the people who found that video playlist, I mean, I cannot tell you the comments I get on these videos of people that are just so grateful for being able to see step by step how to do this process that feels very scary and foreign. And I think if I had just only had that written content, it wouldn't have received the same kind of reviews that it does from YouTube. Oh, I completely agree with this. This is a message I've been saying lately a lot too, because I believe so strongly in the power of just the human voice and how people are connected to voices. And also when you connect, like when you add video to it, your face and like making you human And when you write like a blog post, it's great. (laughs) And you can put your heart into a blog post and people can feel that. But there is nothing like hearing a human voice and connecting with that. And I think like the whole no like trust factor that we're all trying to tap into is huge with that. Like if someone hears your voice and sees your face, they're going to be much more likely to know, like and trust you than if they're just reading a blog post. And I think that is such a big message right now because we're all trying to differentiate ourselves in this really competitive space and make ourselves unique and different and set ourselves apart from the rest of the herd. Um, And this is a really great way to do that. Absolutely. And, you know, I also think that my book would not be doing as well as it's doing right now if I had not created this space where I was very physically present and my audience feels like they know me. You know, they feel like they they know who I am. They know my teaching style because they see me. I think that that has created a space in which people do trust me to come out with a product and and they think that it's going to be beneficial for them because I have created this space in which they see me and they know me. Which platforms are you putting yourself out on? Are you everywhere? Are you YouTube, TikTok, Instagram regularly? And how often? Um, That's a great question. So this last year, TikTok has really won my heart. I was somebody who was a a little hesitant to start it. There's always a new platform. It's very frustrating to to learn a new platform. And I'm someone who believes that you don't have to do everything. But TikTok, I jumped in and I tried it and I've just completely fallen in love with it. For somebody who likes to teach, it's a great platform for teaching. So I would say I probably do spend most of my social media time on TikTok. I try to post, you know, most days, at least one TikTok. Often they're very quick, just responding to a question or showing a quick tip. Um, That's probably where I spend the most time. I do make YouTube videos like formal hosted YouTube videos. I say, I shouldn't say formal. I mean, they're, they're casual, but they're like a full on hosted YouTube video. And I try to publish a few a month. I'm not really on a strict schedule with that. Um, I would like to be, but I'm just doing so many things right now that it's hard to stay on a strict schedule with that. And then I am pretty active on Instagram too. I would say Instagram is where I, in the most casual, I check in most days with a very casual what's going on in, you know, the world of Baker Betty, keep people updated when I'm hosting classes and things like that. So those are the three places that I spend my most, most of my time with. 
Now, we do usually post my YouTube videos also to Facebook and things like that. But, um, you know, kind of reuse that content. But TikTok is really where I'm spending my most of my time. How important is consistency in all of this? Do you feel like somebody needs to start doing video and be consistent and not drop off the face of the earth? I kind of have, mm, I kind of have in the middle thoughts about that. I do think that consistency is always good in this business. I think that when your followers know that you check in every other day or every day or whatever it is once a week, I do think that that helps them stay engaged with you, helps them remember you're around. Um, So I do think some consistency is definitely important. And I don't necessarily think that it has to be every day, but whatever that consistency is that you set up for yourself, I do think that that is important. But I'm also a really big believer that we have to be okay with giving ourselves time and a break. And your core audience is not going to leave you if you do need to do that and you do do that. So I, you know, I'm kind of in the middle on that. I try pretty to be pretty consistent with all of my social media platforms, but I'm also human and I think it's absolutely okay to take breaks when you need to. A great message there too. I so agree with that. And I take long breaks on social media. Mm -hmm. And when I come back, I'm always shocked that people are still there and they, they reply immediately. They're never like, where have you been? I mean, it's like natural for people to go on vacation and need a mental break. So I think that's a great message. Is there anything else you want to leave with food bloggers as far as just building up that confidence and getting into video, anything along those lines? Yeah, I would just say really think about if you want to make video, really consider what is your why? Why do you want to make video? For me, it's because I really enjoy teaching. And I think that that showing the video and being uh, very visual with what I'm doing is very helpful for my audience. So that's my why I'm trying to be the most helpful and accessible for my audience in regarding my teaching. But you probably have a different why. So I think it's really helpful to consider what is your reasoning you want to do video. And then again, like I've said a million times in this, you know, uh, give yourself permission to do it poorly and don't expect perfection from something that you're just learning. You're going to get better as you go along. You'll keep learning and you will meet your expectations, but it's going to take some time. Thank you for encouraging everyone today, Kristen. I think this is such an important message. We need to put ourselves out there more and it's going to positively impact your business, but also your life if you do it consistently and just keep showing up, put out that bad stuff because it's going to be bad, Yep. but it's okay. Embrace that anyway. So thank you for all of this. I have so enjoyed talking to you today. I've so enjoyed talking to you too. Thanks for having me. It's been so fun. So do you have a favorite quote or words of inspiration to leave us with today? Yeah. So it's a very long quote, so I'll have you look it up on your own, but look for the quote. It's Ira Glass on creative process. Um, he just talks about how he wishes somebody told him when he was a beginner that, you know, you're going to get into this work because you have good taste, but your work in the beginning is going to be bad. And it's just going to take you creating a huge volume of work to get to the other side of that. And um, every t- every once in a while when I'm feeling super, super discouraged, I go and I read that quote from Ira Glass and it's it really helps me keep pushing through. I have heard that quote before. I think somebody, another guest on the show has actually used that and I love it. I think it is like the most fitting quote for food bloggers, hands mm-hmm. down. It really I'm is. I'm so glad yeah. you brought that up. We will put together a show notes for you, Kristen. So if anyone wants to go look at that, you can go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash Baker Betty and Betty is spelled with an I-E. 
Tell everyone where they can find you online, Kristen. Yeah. So I am at Baker Betty everywhere. And like Megan said, it's Betty with an IE, not a Y. So you can find me at Baker Betty on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, Facebook. My website is bakerbetty.com. And my book is Baker Betty's Better Baking Book, which you can buy wherever books are sold. Love it. So thanks again for being here, Kristen. And thank you for for having me. Yes. Thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you next time. We're glad you could join us on this episode of Eat Blog Talk. For more resources based on today's discussion, as well as show notes and an opportunity to be on a future episode of the show, be sure to head to eatblogtalk.com. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll be here to feed you on Eat Blog Talk.